So today on the Sound Iron Podcast, we are going to talk about the Octobase. We're going to talk about the Rain Song competition that we just launched. We're going to talk mm-hmm. about the music of Harry Potter. We're going to talk about Mr. Beast and Clyde Shelton and making this podcast funnier. So Craig, are you ready? So last night I was laying in bed and I was like, how do I make this podcast funnier? Because I want to laugh more and we just need to work on making this every composer podcast more humorous. So I don't know if you have any ideas right off the top of your head, but I, I Googled it and I have, I have a few concepts for us. Okay. Okay, so the first thing to make your podcast funnier is a topic and a take. And this person says, try to come up with a take that would get you banned from Facebook. Oh, that's that's real easy. <laughs> you don't so, that people get banned for stuff. They don't even they weren't even trying to get banned. They'll just like say something. It's not even that bad. But then Facebook will be like, that was some kind of death threat. You yeah. got to go. Yeah, or you just get flagged as spam and disappear forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess if you're not on Facebook, you're you're basically you don't exist. And it days. says it says you want to talk about sports, then talk about something specific like like worst football fumbles. So let's pick something like very niche. And it says try recurring segments, have listeners write in, and humor can spring from your excellent personality or your rapport with your co-host. Host with your co-host. Co-host with your co-host. Yeah. Uh, so listeners should write in if you have a joke for us that is uh, readable on air. We will go ahead and you know make this turn this into a joke podcast. Yeah, I'm. Sh- I'll, I'm down for that. Just <laughs> talk about a bunch of horrible jokes and jokes that dad jokes oh yeah you're you're already hitting the dad jokes hard yeah i'm the king of dad jokes but i'm not a dad boom another idea they presented in this article is don't agree too much if you agree too much you will lose your on-air chemistry and banter i disagree with that perfect (laughs) (laughs) no but i do agree yes you're a natural um thanks the other thing it says, what is it? Oh, try to promote the podcast and shill merch as much as possible. So this this person says you need tie-in merch like a spicy habanero sauce or a t-shirt with an inside joke on it. Hmm. I don't know how we can do that one. I'm sure we have some real knee slappers, but I don't know. Do you have any ideas to make this podcast funnier? Uh, more Matthew McConaughey jokes okay. or Matthew McConaughey impersonations. That's what I want to just turn this into, just a, a reason to do stupid voices. Do you think it's funnier if it's a bad impersonation or like if it's good? Because like I, I just need to know if I should be practicing them or not. No, bad impersonations are, are also funny because it, it doesn't a, a good impersonation doesn't always necessarily need to be like the voice nailed. Like you can be like probably 50 percent of the way there and just get like the little nuances of of their voice and yeah. maybe hit it hit it with some body mannerisms and like you can get pretty close because there's times i've done impression impersonations and people are like dude that's like spot on and i'm like i don't even think i sound that close they're like no but it's just something about like like doing the, the body movements will kind of like help so i think the the actual content of what you're saying is really important too if it sounds like something the character would say that's a win yeah yeah. Like, was it like that one guy who was doing like a Jeff Goldblum impersonation? Like, I don't know what he's talking about, like a throat lozenger or something. Like, <laughs> right. oh, y- yes, a throat <laughs> lozenger. Mm. <laughs> and then just like does these like weird like sounds. He's just like, yeah, mm, yeah. Like, like, I don't even know what he's saying half the time, but it's hilarious. Right. <laughs> you don't you don't even need to be speaking English. Exactly. All right, well, just continue your brainstorm on how to make this podcast funnier and as we move on. So the YouTuber Mr. Beast employs a team of six people to make thumbnails for his videos. The thumbnails are planned before the video starts shooting. Oh, wow. So in case you were thinking, maybe thumbnails aren't that important on YouTube, this dude hires six full-time people just to do thumbnails. That's crazy. I wonder if he... Do you think he just like comes up with the idea for the video and just like make a thumbnail for that? I don't know. I'm at a loss with that guy. 
I mean, if you're going to take any YouTube advice from someone, I mean, that dude is one of the few people like really crushing <laughs> YouTube. Yeah. Like, and it's, it's crazy. Like, yeah, he'll just go out and just like give people money or right. like give people a car. Like dude's probably got so much money and he's just like, I didn't really intend for this to to happen this way, but now he's just like, well, I have all this money and all this stuff. Like, there you go. You yeah. Know, and that started already. out, that started out pretty small from what I understand. Like somebody, some company corporate brand approached him and was like, Hey, we want to sponsor your video. And he was like, all right, I want to take that money that you were going to pay me. And I want to just give it away. And they're like, uh, okay. And he did that for the video. That was like the video, the sponsored video was giving that sponsor money to somebody mm -hmm. and it went stupid viral and so they were like wow this was awesome let's do it again and uh it grew from there yeah i think i remember like when he was first starting off wasn't he just doing stuff where he would like film himself for six hours like doing like repetitive stuff yeah for 24 like hour that? challenges and just yeah yeah who has the stamina for that yeah just like like I don't know. I, I can't remember exactly what he was doing, but yeah, I remember it was something where it was kind of like, like ridiculous stuff or just like saying something over and over or going crazy on YouTube, doing crazy stuff. That's maybe what we need to do. Just do crazier stuff. Yeah. Just like, like as I'm doing a walkthrough, just like headbutt the keyboard or something. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if you break things on camera, that would definitely increase the view count. Ooh, we should do like, uh, how does the sample library sound? But I'm like, playing it with hammers like i'm just <laughs> wrecking the keyboard is all right so let's check out these impacts and just like start smashing my keyboard that's a good idea that would go viral on tiktok for sure yeah but i'm gonna have to get uh endorsed by native native instruments just i need a, a new uh s61 right every week because it's going down i mean it would be worth it you just see like this massive pile of broken keyboards in my trash can people are garbage guys coming by like what the hell is yeah, going on this dude's got in there yeah it's thinking i got crazy anger problems or something and you do but that's beside the point i mean we're not going to talk about that on this podcast <laughs> but i mean i mean i can if you want no let's, let's take it at a different angle so let's talk about our new library the octobase so this is a 12 foot tall base or as i like to say two Craigs standing on top of each other. Uh, that's a fair assessment. I'm actually 5'11". Okay. So. Well, it's not quite 12 feet. I, I rounded up. So it's actually yeah. pretty perfect. So yeah. this thing, you have to stand on a platform in order to bow it. And it's, it's held down. The strings are held down for the notes by levers. So you're, you're not actually using your left hand to like mm -hmm. play the notes you have to push levers and the levers push the notes down like hold the yeah, strings down it's like a clamp they're just bowing this massive instrument yeah uh, yeah when i was like first kind of doing some research on it i was just like yeah because when you think like like okay this instrument that's this tall how do you even play it and then i was like oh yeah like you gotta yeah stand on this little like platform thingy and like pull these little levers and it like clamps down on the frets which is pretty genius but it's it's crazy man like when i was first playing around with this instrument i was like oh man like it's the deepest and lowest orchestral string instrument in the world yeah it's wild yeah it's crazy it's like it goes an oct it's an octave below basses right uh-huh so yeah it's it's crazy like i'm really curious to start composing with it and actually like hearing it with like because you know a lot of times people double like cello lines with the basses and they'll do it an octave below and it's like now you can use the octo bass and go even lower than that yep. or even or even thinking about using it in a way to where it's kind of like um because you know like people use like sine waves and stuff to kind of support orchestral compositions to give it that kind of you know because sometimes it won't have that naturally so they'll use that as more of like a production yeah just like a sub trick. root trick yeah, so I'm I'm curious to even try using it like that, like maybe just like having it in the center, or or even just like you know putting it to the right kind of where cellos and basses are usually, you know, in the orchestra, just to hear how it would sound. But yeah, yeah. it's it's yeah. I first thing I did was play that low C, and I was just like, oh, like my sub was just like, <laughs> and just vibrating. But it's it's, it's earth shattering. Yeah, it's it's cool because it's like yeah, you can you can have like a sine wave 
to to have that kind of low stability. But the cool thing about this is that you know you can go that octave lower, and it's got all that like sub information, but it also has that that bow sound. So it's like not just a low sounding sub, like right. it actually has that kind of bowed timbre, which I think is really cool because you can get that low information, but still have that kind of attack and another layer on top of the other strings, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it's a real acoustic instrument with overtones and resonance, and it's not just a simple sine wave. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, I believe there's only like six of these made. Yeah, I think there's only a few in existence. And so this one was in Milan, Italy, mm -hmm. and uh, we recorded remotely with a Italian team over there. And they got all kinds of articulations that are really cool. Lots of staccato, spiccato, tremolo, like swell sustains, tons of stuff that are very usable and like plug and play. Yeah, like swell sustains, sforzando sustains, harmonic sustains, flatandos, if you're into that. Yeah. You want to add a octo bass flatando into your track? Boom. Boom. Craig, you know what would make this podcast funnier is if we had surprise guest appearances that are like 10 minutes in. Mike, welcome. <laughs> we were just we were just talking about how to make this podcast funnier and uh, surprise guests are a good idea. Uh, I guess that means I have to be funny and I can't promise anything <laughs> you better, remotely like that. You better bring the jokes or we, <laughs> will, bring it. we will make you exit this podcast. Right. I, that's probably for game. the best. Honestly. honestly, if you expel me, that might be the most entertaining thing that could happen <laughs> with me. Um, uh, so, Craig, t tell us about the Rain Song competition that we just launched. People have over two weeks to make a composition using a free library. All right, so we've brought back the Creator Challenge. Uh, a few weeks ago, we released Rain Song, which is a free library, and we thought it'd be cool to bring back the Creator Challenge and do a new scoring competition uh, where you can download Rain Song, use it in, in your track. Uh, you can use other virtual instruments if you want to, but the main thing is we want you to, you know, see how much you can get out of Rain Song because it's loaded with a bunch of really awesome ambiences and really cool sounds. And uh, the last one we did was a Halloween themed one in October. So we're bringing it back and uh, got a cool new video that we put together so you can score it using Rain Song. And uh, yeah, you can win some store credit. And all you got to do is just score the video, put it on YouTube, hashtag Sound Iron Creator Challenge. Boom. And then everyone gets to see your cool stuff. Yeah. And, and this library has shorts in it that you can do percussion with, which is really nice. And it's got lots of soundscapes and drones and things like that. So you can throw those into your own sampler or DAW if you're not using the full retail contact. Um, and so it's really easy to stretch or reverse sounds using the wave files. Mm -hmm. You got some nice rain ambiences that'll fit nicely with the video as well. Well, a pretty good variety of different kinds of rain in different environments. It was just fun to kind of put it all together into a little style package that just like, you know, where the sound is on, like the percussive elements are actually individual splats and raindrops and things like that. But some of them have a pretty good amount of bass, depending on the surface that it was landing on. They make good little drums. Uh, not as not as thin and gossamer as you would think just from thinking about raindrops. But um, the end result is... is a cool playable little library. You know, we've been wanting to do more and more of that kind of thing where mostly what we're recording is instruments in kind of ideal settings, but one of my big loves is field recording, just sound effects and environments, things like that, just capturing the space. And a lot of times you can get really interesting instruments out of that. Our anti-drum series and the early sick libraries one and two and subways and streetcars and, and a few others that we have are like that that kind of delve into some of the field recording we've done but and how to turn that into musical instruments going just beyond found sound and like all right kind of forcing it into a mix that was always the traditional way of doing found sound music production but by being able to actually instrumentalize it play it on a keyboard as pitched instruments or at, you know using a variety of tools that are built into the interface and then some of it sound designed into more properly tonal uh, instrument elements uh, using, you know, post-production techniques kind of to bring out what's already there or sort of mutate it in weird ways. Pretty much we throw every trick in the book at, at it when we're creating. Just sort of the sound calls us in a direction and we experiment with it and see what can make it sound cool, but also usable musically. 
uh, still kind of following the principle of what, you know, musicality as, as instrument categories. Uh, so with percussion, you know, like things that could f function as a bass drum, things that can function as a snare, as a hi-hat, as a cymbal, things that can work as, um, as lead melody instruments that are kind of a woodwind quality or a piano-esque quality or, you know, tuned percussion. How do you make all the food groups present from a sound source that doesn't, doesn't really lend itself to that when you first think about it? Yeah, it's like not intended to be that way, but, you know, by just relating it to sounds that that you already know, it's kind of like, oh, this sort of shares that quality and you can use that in a in a way that is similar. But now it's a completely different sound source, which makes it even more unique than just reaching for a kick drum. It's like, oh, this was, you know, this rain sound or, or something, but now it's used for, you know, replacing what would be like a kick drum and it sounds totally different. And the best yeah. part is the bragging rights afterward, because how many people are you going to tell that you used a raindrop as a kick and snare, right? Yeah, I think I think people are always looking for new ways to kind of recreate the same sounds because everyone like, oh, everyone's got that kick drum, you know, but it's like when you start to use other sound sources that aren't necessarily supposed to be that and making it sound like that, it makes it that much cooler, I think, especially if you want just more original sounds. Yeah, what I think is is sort of distinct about our approach um, is when gathering, f you know, sound effects, we approach like any environment or situation, if we're going to try to turn it into an instrument, it's getting, we get a ton of content, but it's not then just dumped into a bucket and handed to you to work with and say, all right, find the gold in there, good luck. Um, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that approach, but... But, you know, if, if the person on the receiving end, the user, really likes getting in there and most of the experience for them is about the assembly, the exploration of the sound. And, and, but in a lot of cases, they have their own equipment. They're going to do a lot of that themselves. But this is sort of different because this is our obsession, which is like how to make an instrument a playable instrument from, you know, say if it's, a, if it's an actual instrument we're sampling or an, a room, an environment, a space, a, a concept like rain. What do you do with it to make it more musical? Like, so it's not just raw field recordings left as is. Like, it's it's selected. Everything's kind of shaped curated. a little bit. Yeah, curated and then kind of massaged a little bit to be a little bit more applicable so that it's you get a little bit more of that immediate gratification when you're, when you're trying to work with it as an instrument. You know what it is. It sounds authentic. In fact, that's the point, is that, you know, we get obsessive about the, the specific equipment we use. Um, to capture just those right elements in just that right light, trying to delve more into aesthetics than just purely uh, what is it? Well, why is it? Why is it cool? What does it evoke in in your memory, um, um, in your sort of previous experience with media, with art, with music? Just as a human being living on Earth and the sort of sensory flow that we all take in all the time, it builds up these sort of affinities and um, how to go about it and what are you trying to present? What aesthetic um, are you trying to evoke? Because that's the point. Music, musical elements are often just almost like emotional paint. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to make these colors that, that shouldn't be generic. They should feel a little loaded, a little bit heavy with personality and intent. Um, they should evoke like some kind of aesthetic archetype, even if you go, you know, if they're new and how you captured them or the point is that that recognition, that musical familiarity, that home that you hear when you hear a sound that works well, like clanging on a metal like plate that you can go about that two ways. You find the right mallet to go with it and you can bring out some really beautiful resonance or you just use a metal hammer and bang and like two different worlds from the same object. Mm -hmm. One of them can be used in an entirely different kind of music than the other. And they both have their place. So we bring a hammer and we bring the mallet. But, um, you know, there's a lot to the world. And those food groups, I think, matter when you're constructing music. Because I think as much as I try to, to disregard rules in, in music making as a, I don't know, I, I mean, I guess as an ethos, uh, at the same time, um, there are certain tendencies and patterns that really work well when you, when you follow them. Like... You know, the elements that make a good bass, snare, hi-hat, and cymbal, and toms, and then also melodic instruments. If you substitute those with other sound sources that sort of fit the vibe or evoke that same feeling, 
then the person on the receiving end, the listener, not just the, the composer, but I mean the listener, they'll hear that it musically for what it is and its colors and its character for what it is um, and take it at musical face value. And I mean like just absorb it in, in that way where they don't question, oh, what is that noise? Uh, I don't, you know, like it just immediately works as an instrument. It all feels just that it's like a different kind of musical palette. There, it, you know, the brain is sort of momentarily or permanently tricked into not noticing just how weird the, the arrangement really is underneath the surface. Like what weird objects got replaced. Their brain just assumes, well, that all the pieces are where they are sonically. Um, and so there's nothing missing and there's nothing weird. But yet you are exposing them into a kind of new weird sound idea and, and express and, and, and sort of like expanding in that way, making normal what, you know, you're kind of like sort of edging them into weirder and weirder sounds as as like sort of like normal musical instruments. Yeah, it kind of makes me think of like abstract art, you know, when people do it in a way to where maybe it looks kind of like a silhouette of a face, but it's not necessarily or it's like abstract enough to where. You can't really tell what it is, but you sort of take it for what you get from it. You know, like, oh, that kind of does look like a face, like, you know, yeah. so, you know, and and uh, it's cool because it's kind of like you you get what you're sort of, I don't know, subconsciously Parad getting from it sort of thing. Yeah, like, pareidolia. It's like musical pareidolia where you, yeah. you sort of anthropom anthropomorphize what you're experiencing as, oh, that's a normal, you fill in the gaps that your brain mm -hmm. sort of because it identifies the basic principles of what it's hearing as like, okay, that fits in this, as this component in, in a, in a well-balanced musical arrangement. I think that that really defines how we approach all sounds. Like, you know, we, when we explore classical instruments or any other kind of instruments, there are certain kind of principles we follow. Like if it's a bowed instrument, then there are going to be certain principles you'll follow in approaching this, the articulations you record with that and a piece of metal that is also bowable. Or a piece of glass, if you can get, you know, if if it offers those sounds, often you can get a lot of the same kinds of articulations, and so you can you can create a true like functional substitute that means, well, I was using a violin for this part, but there's this series of vases over here that kind of fit the role, and you can, you know, use, and then you might explore that and see what mm -hmm. you can do with that. We were just talking about octobase. By the time this podcast comes out, we will have just released octobase. So I was going to ask you about the remote recording and if you could tell us some about the octobase itself. Yeah. First and foremost, you'll see it spelled two different ways. O-K-T-O-B-A-S-S -S or O-C-T-O. German versus, versus Italian uh, spellings. There were a lot of weird instruments being explored back then. That was in the era where pianos could have just tons of pedals. <laughs> uh, and, and various kinds of string arrangements. Everybody was really innovating. Uh, the mid-1800s, you know, that was kind of the beginning of what people thought was going to be kind of an age of wonder. Very tumultuous time in world history, but at the same time, a lot of technologies were starting to be cracked, finally, uh, that, and, and put into practice. So like steam engines and things like that uh, becoming mainstream. And what you could do with machining and all that, you started to have all kinds of crazy things being built. I, I was just uh, reading yesterday about a, uh, or just seeing, I saw a an ad for a mustache guard for when you're eating soup. Your, <laughs> oh, your wow. luxurious mustache can be protected with this metal cover that you would, I guess, take out and put on as you're about to have a fancy dinner and not get soup in your mustache. So a mustache bib? That's a, yeah, no, not a, an actual contraption. It, oh, wow. it had a whole, like, it was like headgear you had to put on for eating soup just in case you had a really fancy mustache, I guess. People were doing, I mean, I guess we're in that era again now where just weird, weird shit is being built just because it can. Yeah, just like super, super specific use cases. Like, yeah. you're only going to use this whenever you eat soup, which who knows how often that is. <laughs> <laughs> My point being is around that time, a lot of invention was being becoming possible simply because fabricating metal machinery became simpler and simpler. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's why you started seeing a lot of interesting things like this, because this was meant to be a giant sort of ultra sub bass version of a double bass. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it gets uh, gets a full, not quite a full octave below the bottom of a piano. And, and it has a series of levers up at the top that actually fret the the, the fingerboard, because the fingerboard is like six feet off the ground. And so you have to s climb some steps to play this thing. So like what looks like a gigantic German bow 
you're bowing on the strings, this custom bow, and um, then your left hand, you're working these giant levers. It's almost like a giant gear shift. Yeah. But but more, I mean, like, or a giant lever typewriter, but, I mean, they're just the, these paddles, but they're long rod, metal rods, very 18th century looking kind mm-hmm. of contrap, you know, machinery. It's all clockwork. There was nothing motorized about it. It was first shown in Paris in, 19, in 1849. It didn't really ever catch on, but everybody thought it might because it just had this impressive feel and look. And you had that in the back of an or, you know, or in the, in the section. It just stands out as, as kind of like they were, I mean, there were some weird experiments with brass instruments that were kind of absurd back then too. Visual uh, spectacle was pretty significant culturally back then around the world. I mean, or at least in the, you know, in what, you know, the Western world with, with, the, with its media flow. Um, you know, there was no TV. There was, there was not even radio yet. There were newspapers. You needed to have something that would just wow an audience and sort of like catch attention. There were some, some similarities to now and then, honestly, in, in the kind of cultural moment that was going on at the time with technology, with music, with culture, uh, and the conflicts that kind of swirled around all of those things as things were really rapidly changing. The Industrial Revolution was like really in full swing then. Uh, industrialization in uh, Europe and in northern United States was just a, proceeding at in an insane pace. So, like, life went from agrarian to very built up and urban and technological very quickly. Why an instrument like this came to be at that time, I think, really does make sense. It's like you, it became physically possible to build it and have the kind of complex operation that, that could be much, I mean, like assembled in a, in a way that didn't require a, a complex sort of like pass down development process, like making a violin or even a double bass is an order of magnitude simpler, at least than building something like this, which would, which had a lot more in common with like a church organ or something like that, uh, but still needed to be portable because they would, the idea was that this would tour. So you, I guess you put it in a giant shipping crate, I guess, and take it because it, it, it did tour the world, the first uh, couple of them in uh, different exhibitions and, and, and symphonic concerts. So much that people thought that you might have rows of them in future uh, orchestras. Because um, at the <laughs> yeah. time, futurism was like huge then too. Everybody imagined, well, what, what is, where's this all going? Yeah. So this thing was almost 12 feet tall. One person played it, but certainly it wasn't a one person move it kind of thing. So this was oh, meant no. to go with big orchestras. This modern version is a replica. Well, I mean, I don't want, I can't really call it a replica because like every instrument's in a replica. This was built to the original specifications. So it's, it's accurate. Back in 96, 1996, uh, I guess in this, for this kind of instrument, we got to specify. Right. Uh, 1996, uh, Nicola Minetta, an Italian double bass player, worked with a luthier, uh, Pierre Boer. And they both lived in, um, in Italy. We didn't really get into sort of what led them to need to remake this. I think it was just the ultimate kind of challenge and the mystery of it. Because this instrument became a museum piece. There was only like two, three in the world that survived from the 1800s. And one of them was in a museum in France. I mean, nobody really was able to play these things. They were not around, so they were kind of more legendary. It, or mm. kind of, you know, just a, a weird oddity. Whatever concert you're going to have it at, it's going to take center stage. So... While I say it goes, uh, you know, to the C below the A that a a piano ends at, but it doesn't, it's not just like a low note in that same way that a piano is a a low note, but clean. This thing roars Mm because the wood, the whole body of it just resonates. So it has that chuffy kind of like growl of a double bass at the bottom, Mm -hmm. but just keeps going farther and farther down. And you just hear the, I mean, those low frequencies, you know, you, you just, you can count the beats. Like, it's, it's not like, it, it gets to the bottom of what we humans experience as notes. Like, in the, in the walkthrough I was describing, it almost sounds like, like a, an acoustic muscle car or something. It's just like, like, oh my God. It's like, like, I can only imagine, like, hearing it live, especially in, like, a, some kind of, like, concert hall or something. But, like, I, I've seen some videos of people talking about it. It almost sounds better like outside of the room. It, like if it's in like a like in a big museum type area, like and if it's played, that it's it actually sounds better in the next room because it takes so long for those you know sound waves to travel. So you actually like yeah get, to a holy like, form. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just, it's cool. It's cool being able to like layer this under like an octave underneath basses. 
Now, because of where the way we we mic'd it, especially the close mics, you get a lot of the instrument texture. Um, so the bass is there, but it's not overwhelming. It, so it sounds like just a, like a monstrously huge double bass up close with a lot of wood, a lot of string in the noise in the character. So it sounds like an instrument, like very mm -hmm. hands-on, not just tone. And then the, the room mics are set back eight feet from that, and they're more omni-condensers, so they pick up the whole room, but still well within that, like 30 feet is kind of where you need to be for the full, mm -hmm. so, you know, wave to really fully develop. So it's that if you, you can boost the body of the instrument up, EQ up some monstrous bass, it would sound bassier, like you said, 30 feet back, but less like then you're hearing the whole room rattle. Mm -hmm. And, um, or, you know, and, and it's sort of like, you have to sort of like, it's a it's one of those instruments or sound sources that you can't really get it from a single perspective. You yeah. need a couple of perspectives to really understand the sound that the instruments can produce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like the sound of it when you have the close mics and the far mics together. Like it really, like those those uh, far mics really add a lot of like depth to the sound and really kind of mm -hmm. opens it up. Like you it really hear that more of like the, yeah, like the sound of the room because it's just like, it just kind of like widens up and just yeah. sounds really full and yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's like the room becomes a second order acoustic body to the instrument. So it just kind of the whole room becomes the instrument. And, you know, for something that bassy, the whole building, like you'd probably, you know, pretty far away in the building, you'd hear at least the, not just rumble, but you'd hear, you'd feel a note. A little bit like, you know, when you have a car with a souped up stereo that you sort of feel in your gut from blocks away before you ever hear really anything. Mm -hmm. The subwoofer. The subwoofer, but just that, yeah. And it's like, it's just vibrating the, 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 the whole environment. Yeah, it's, um, it's like when you're driving and you're listening to music and some car pulls up next to you, but you can't hear their music. All of a sudden you just feel, mm -hmm. you're, like, you're like, whoa, I don't remember uh, getting that big old subwoofer in, in this car. And then you're like, oh, it's the, then you turn your music off and hear mm -hmm. like right next to you. I can relate to wanting to be like swimming in sound so much that things are almost like dust is levitating off of your, <laughs> your dashboard. I can, like it physically can feel cool, but like, yeah. Every minute you're in that environment, you're losing time off your ears. Like, yeah. you're gonna go deaf. En some of those enough, I mean, you're gonna get internal in organ damage, honestly. I, they, you can do some harm to your guts if you really pound them with uh, low frequency, high amplitude sound. I wanna be like that guy from those old Maxwell commercials. You remember those where the dude's sitting in a chair and then like the sound starts playing and he's like getting blown away. That'd be like me and like my hair would probably yeah. like fly off or something. I mean, a sound pressure wave that that could do that would probably be fatal. <laughs> yeah, just your, eye, your eyeballs like, just get pushed into the back of your head or something. Or yeah, you'd rupture. Like they're just bad things would happen because if it's moving that kind of air, I mean, at that point it's an explosion. Yeah, I mean, there's yep. a fine line between loud sound and explosion in a certain sense, at least in a, as a concussive force. But I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's almost like the food equivalent of like, you know, when people eat like really hot hot sauce or like chilies. Yeah. It's like, how is it even enjoyable anymore? It's just like setting your mouth and body on fire. Like you'll see people just like sweating. I get it. You want to go hot, but it's almost, yeah, it's not even like enjoyable anymore. It's just you're just torturing yourself yeah. by just pushing it to the extreme. <laughs> Way, way back when, in the early 2000s, when I was doing a lot of new music journalism, I was uh, interviewing um, Stabbing Westward, Chris the singer. After we had finished the interview, he, they were playing a show at the Pound SF, like this uh, nightclub called The Pound in San Francisco. I don't even mm -hmm. know if it's around anymore. I don't, um, think, I don't think so, but yeah, I, I know a lot of bands who have played there. Yeah, and uh, so I was like right up at the stage like where the subwoofers were i had hearing protection on i had ear earplugs but like my midsection was lined up with the the subwoofer on the stacks mm -hmm. and uh like at a certain point there was like this feeling of unease i started to get like is this medically a problem because i started to like just hurt yeah. <laughs> all through that whole region I had to take a step back after a little while, like several way in the back. And I kind of, for a few days, I felt a little bit like cooked. <laughs> not oh, wow. really, you know, not not quite, but you know, I just a little over, like my guts were clipping. You're like, you know? I don't remember eating Chipotle the other day. I don't know. Why do I feel <laughs> yeah. like, why do I don't I know. Maybe, maybe it was psychosomatic. I, I, 
I don't claim to have any medical knowledge, but like I do know that high enough amplitude sound can absolutely be weaponized. <laughs> yeah, you were asked. You asked about um, the the whole remote process. So this instrument, obviously, it's it's uh, you know it's almost twelve feet tall. It lives where it 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 the, it's in a room and it doesn't really leave that room except when it's going on tour. So it's built into um, Nicola's house or in the in the building he lives in. It's kind of like a private gallery in it uh, that has uh, a place for all of his instruments and artwork because he's also a, an artist. Kind of centered in the room is this big instrument with its playing platform. So that's where it was sampled. Uh, and, and we did that with the help of uh, Giorgio uh, Riolo and Danielle Bertolini. They uh, basically were a local team there that originally had sampled this in a much simpler way. Their approach um, was more of a, a classical sampling of just kind of like basic articulations and uh, most of the mic positions were mono. And so it wasn't quite the way we go about it. We wanted to really see what we could do with this thing. Like, but doing it remotely, we'd never done before a session like this. So we, we basically set up a, a video stream with the audio from the recorders going through the net um, using Listen To, which is a really good platform I'd recommend. And then we just had TalkBack going with like uh, Google Voice. Everybody could see me on my little screen, <laughs> on a little screen, and I could see them. And uh, so I was able to basically walk them through how to position the mics to get the the sound that we're, we were kind of after, how close to get them, where to place them, and then kind of how to get the articulations. Because so, the 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 other necessity is that it would integrate well with uh, our existing libraries to go as the lowest end of the solo strings we're working on. It should be able to click well together with with all of them. So getting the same articulations the same way as much as is possible. I mean, obviously, you have to essentially transpose your 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 expectations uh, on a, you know, when you go from one instrument to another, especially when it's like a different order of instrument versus, you know, if it's a giant double bass versus a double bass, that you can't approach them exactly the same way. Some mm -hmm. things inform them, but some you kind of have to dial it in based on, okay, how do we deal with this given the size and, and how this thing behaves. So we basically, you know, did a couple of test sessions to get the, the setup right. And then from there, uh, recorded the whole thing in 32-bit so that it could get a really good wide dynamic range and uh, just get every possible uh, detail in the sound. That, that was kind of the whole process. It took a few sessions, I think four total, over a period of a week and a half or so, or two weeks. Uh, Nicola was awesome. You know, he has a very classical education and musically, and, and the way we go about sampling things is kind of oftentimes has to be much more literal. Like, mechan not, I, I don't want to say mechanical, but you, you are breaking things down into fundamental, elemental co concepts. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you deliver a single staccato by itself with emotion and yet have it be in isolation? So he was able to kind of follow us through that. And then in the end result was this huge library. Yeah, I really like uh, the per the percussion stuff that he got because it it you know with how big the, the instrument is like I'm I'm really glad that we got that because like some of the percussion sounds that come from this thing sound wild like like a ton of low end or some that are really like more like clacky and and higher timbered yeah but like some of the lower ones are just like boom, like it like it could totally use that as some kind of you know if if you're wanting to have some percussion in your track that isn't just like a certain drum or something or you want to layer it with drums like it really has like a, a unique sound of its own for percussion and it's, it's not designed for that but it's cool that we have that because it's just getting as much sort of like juice from the instrument because there's you know so many different ways that you can get sound and extract it from that and that's kind of you know that that's that's really the the approach is to have if we get an instrument try to get beyond just fundamental articulations get some unique ones that, that have musicality that we can, you know, that maybe are often overlooked, mm -hmm. but would be really way more interesting to have a lot of times than the fundamental, like the core articulations that an instrument produces. Because, you know, you're often looking, well, what, what new thing can I, can I capture? And with sampling, it doesn't have to be practical to physically play on the instrument. If we can capture those sounds, then we can turn it into an easily played instrument it sort of changes how you can approach instruments and almost turns them on their head to like, what else can this thing do? Mm -hmm. And with, uh, with the octobase, like with all of those, it was, it was necessary absolutely to get percussive content. Uh, he, they weren't like, 
keen to go at it with like you know mm-hmm. rubber mallets or anything like that. Um, <laughs> for mine, you know, there might have been a few little dents and <laughs> scratches. That's you know that's often the sort of the difference in when we get our hands on an instrument because it's something we can physically play. Mm-hmm. Then um, there there will always be damage at the end, <laughs> not intentional and not excessive, but wear and tear. Some instruments uh, may may be hurt during the process of sampling. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like you you kind of got to break the mold to a, a little bit of a degree. So I have been revisiting the music of Harry Potter. I don't know if you've seen those movies. Harry Potter? Are they uh, not dark enough, not horror enough for you? I I know. I, I, I really like the music. I've just It's funny. I've just never watched Harry Potter. That's what I thought. So I haven't seen all of them either, to be to be frank. But the first three movies were done by John Williams. And I have some backstory for you. So before any of it was made, the books were written, obviously. But Warner Brothers calls Johnny up and says, hey, could you compose some music for our promo reel? Uh, we're working on this, like, to pitch Harry Potter, the movie. Mm -hmm. And um, we haven't made the the reel yet, but if you could just compose like a couple minutes of music for this sight unseen, that'd be awesome. And we'll just run with it. And the dude sits down on a Celeste and he writes Hedwig's theme, which is the main theme, the most popular theme of Harry Potter. And he's never seen a single image of Harry Potter. He probably hasn't read the books. Wasn't, I wasn't sure about that, but absolute savage right just yeah just goes in crushes it all right uh, uh, writes the most iconic theme of harry potter without seeing any of the movie there is no movie and uh so some some notes that i took while i'm watching this movie last night the score is incredibly loud like they have this dude cranked through the movie um he goes absolutely ham in the credits i was letting the credits play out last night Mm -hmm. And he's just like, I haven't gotten enough notes in. And it's just just everywhere. Yeah, because like, yeah, he'll have a lot of these like like running like string lines while like all this other stuff is going on. It's just like whimsical AF. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And he talks about when he was writing Hedwig's theme, he wanted it to be this pre-flight idea where the the flight is about to happen and you're just kind of building and building and building with this mystical, whimsical. Uh, broomstick kind of idea Mm -hmm. and so he uses melodies over and over and there have been I think three other composers who have composed Harry Potter movies afterward and they all kind of have to use the same framework Mm -hmm. and then he's using the celeste which the celeste is a glockenspiel that you play like a piano basically Mm -hmm. and uh, a funny story on that is the pianist who was going to record the celeste for the recording session got a mm-hmm. call beforehand that said, hey, uh, you're going to want to look at this music for the, before the session. And he was like, I knew what that meant. And because typically the session players show up at the session, never seen the music, never practiced, and they're all L.A. or LSO and they're total pros and they just sight read everything. Mm-hmm. But this dude was like, okay. Yeah, send me the music. So he gets this Hedwig's theme music, and it's like crazy hard because, it's, you know, as a if, a if you're a glockenspiel player, you are typically playing two or four mallets, but mm-hmm. with a celeste, you can play all ten fingers. So you got a lot faster action going on. Uh, so this dude, the pianist, he mixed a Yamaha DX7 sine wave with celeste samples, with real samples, and that is the sound you hear in the first movie. Oh, wow. Yeah, because there's like some celeste shred in that, isn't it? Like where it's just like kind of doing a lot of runs and yes. Yeah, it's wild to watch this this guy play through the music. It's it's uh, really intense. So that's Harry Potter. And we're revisiting it because it's we're coming up on Christmas time. And they're kind of they have Christmas elements in them. Uh, but the most popular celeste piece of all time is Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairy from the Nutcracker. And uh, so it was just interesting to see Mr. Williams at work doing doing some crazy stuff back in the back in 2001. Yeah, I really like the stuff that Alexander Desplat did, too. I think he did. Uh, I forget which ones. But he did the last two movies. Yeah, like he, he's one of my favorite composers. Like Mr. Was it Mr. McGorm's Wonder Emporium? Like, yeah, I love that soundtrack. It's so good. Like he's just yeah he's an awesome uh, awesome composer. It's funny like every now and again I'll listen to a 
a score and I'm like, why do I like this so much? And now like, I'll always Google the who did the music for it. Like, I think I was watching like The Secret Life of Pets and I was like, man, the music is really good. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, it kind of sounds like this plot. And then I'll look him up and like, oh, there it's it is. yeah, him and Elfman. I have those those kind of stories where I'm like, who did this? Oh, it was yeah. Elfman. Yeah, I actually thought he did the music for Up, but I think that's uh, who's that? Was that Michael Giacchino? Yeah, it's Giacchino. Yeah, but I but I thought it it was very Desplat esque. I was like, I wonder if if they used him as like a like a temp track or something because it, it's very Desplat esque. I can hear that. Yeah, Siriana was another one he did. Really good soundtrack. Yeah, he's he's a brilliant composer. I had one more thing I wanted to show you, and this is more this is a of a thing that we're gonna be building into later but starting production on now i don't know if i can get it into the frame is it yeah here it is or if it even makes sense visually yeah i mean uh i can kind of see what's going on i can see it's a rig it's got telephones uh, yes yeah so it's got a couple of those so these are old handsets one's a army radio handset one's an actual telephone so the point here is the reason it's so wacky looking is I wanted a good way to record all of these different kinds of mic types with vocals all at once while them with them all being on axis essentially. I mean it's less crucial with the shittier ones. Right. Uh but uh but it's still I wanted to have, you know, a single pop filter in front and then just be able to holler at these things. Basically, this is a tin can mic. Highly recommend these guys. You can make your own, uh, but uh, the the company that made them did an excellent job, and so I really recommend. And and they were really super affordable. And the jack in them is very snug and secure. So awesome sound, terrible awesome sound. This is an old Sanyo hand mic from an ancient reel to reel that I unfortunately don't have anymore. But the mic I do, like the grossest looking old plug. <laughs> um, this doodad is the first mo vocal mic, I, first microphone I ever got by University Sound. I guess some company that ceased to exist long ago in Michigan. It's beat to hell. And it has a very muddy sound, I mean, but warm sound I like. Um, then a proper TLM 103, hang it upside down so it can be aligned proper. Uh, so, uh, so it would be like the, the standard perfect fidelity mic. Mm -hmm. And then these two handsets. So the idea here is uh, to explore some vocals, uh, vocal series that gives you some options of fidelity, not just fidelity, because I think we're also going to play a little bit with what do we do after the fact and running them through not just tape, but like different kinds of aged recording media mm -hmm. um, to kind of capture the different characteristics of the, of the same sound. You can't really fake this stuff in post. You just can't. Yeah. I mean, you can. Uh, but but it's cooler. It sounds like more authentic. It's not just about authentic. Yeah, it's like it, it the the flaws in the way it sounds are they tap they scratch certain itch uh, mm -hmm. sort of both nostalgia and also aesthetic. Like you know if you're gonna do some character voiceover with like police radio, it's way better to get a CB and broadcast your voiceover track and catch it at the other end than it is just to try to use some EQ and mm -hmm. distortion effects and stuff. Like, do the real thing because it's gonna take on characteristics, especially if you can create some interference or other things like that around it that might give it some quirks and stuff that you really can't fake. That's, I guess that's the thing, is certain things you really can't fake and if you're gonna go through the trouble to try to create them, try to capture them the correct way, like yeah. from the get go. So yeah, I've got a CB, not a CB radio, a bullhorn, mic that I really like the sound of. It's awful. So I'm, I might, but I don't want to dewire it from this thing. So I might see if I can tap it. That'd be another thing to add, but. I like to say that using hardware like that takes you places that you probably wouldn't get to with the software. Yeah. How many inputs is that total? Well, this is going to be, this is six. And uh, that's probably what I'll keep it. Cause I, I don't want to get too insane with the number of tracks. That's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, you know, we could we could add more. Um, there's only so many mic. I mean, I guess it is second row above it on a second stand. <laughs> um, but I don't. You know, th these are all like that's the other thing. They're not just random mics. They each have a. They're chosen for being the epitome of whatever vibe they each have. 
Mm. And so I don't, it's not just like, oh, just grab every crappy mic or, you know, transducer I can find. And it's kind of like, well, each one has to sort of represent its, its ideal. Yeah, the character mics. Yeah. 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 Like a military handset is different than a uh, generic old office telephone. What do the tin can mics sound like? Is it like a metal plate? Well, it's it's a tin can. It's a it's a contact mic. Okay. Inside this, uh, God, the only way I can describe it, it does have like a ribbon like quality to it, almost like Hanna Barbera esque. Uh, in this library, the the new library we have coming up, have, I'm not going to delve into. I guess if we're going to keep it a secret, <laughs> but uh, one of the mic positions is a stereo pair of these. Nice. And it's, you know, so it's uh, it, it includes a pair of 103s. So, you know, no noise, natural fidelity, a lot of body and character. And then a pair of KM183s, which are um, pencil omnis, Neumanns as well. Also extremely low noise, really, you know, natural, great transient response, crisp sound. But then I wanted something different. And this, and with bells, if the mics aren't really just really good mics, it'll sound like nails on chalkboard. You can't, you you know, like low fidelity bells can sound nightmarishly bad. So it's, they've, you've got to really round things off. And it's, and it can't just be like a, a you know, like a, a low pass. It's got to also kind of, the transients and everything have to kind of be sh- shaved and sort of smoothed down. And everything just kind of has to be mellowed out a lot. These kind of have that mellow vibe. Cool. Mm-hmm. Very, very, um, like vintage sounding, but by result, not by design, because they're not really, you know, there's some similarity in the technologies that go into this and old, what you would have seen that look like tin can mics in the 1930s and 20s. But like, uh, it has a lot of that same character. I love a, of a, like a 1920s era mic. A little nasally, but not, not, not pinched. Um, just <laughs> honky, but not uh, overly oppressively resonant in the mid frequencies it's it's just kind of pleasant for a, a kind of a, a washed out kind of and the signal is clean and strong and not noisy really um it does it picked up some interesting kind of certain notes in you know did cause unique i don't know what you'd call it artifacts in the sound that weren't audible in the other mics hmm. but but were fundamentally integrated into the sound that makes me think that it was just the materials you know, resonating, causing that themselves. But it was, um, I, I don't want to spoil it, but I really liked the sound of it. It was really kind of a pleasant, cool sound. I would use it in something. Because it, it's not, you know, if you sequenced a melody with it, it would kind of have a very classic, you know, radio age kind of sound, you know, like could do some stuff that had some, that vibe, I think, really well. Love it. All right, let's move to our recommendation section and wrap this thing up. So this is the part of the program that you can tell us about any media you're enjoying, music, plugins, movies, all that stuff. I'll go first while you guys are thinking about it. And mine is Clyde Shelton. He is an electronic music artist. Uh, He makes music called Data Wave, and he's from Pomona, California. And he has an album called Spending Spirit. And mm-hmm. it is just killer instrumental music. If you're just trying to get in the zone and like type in emails or something, it is really great. Got to check that out. Clyde Shelton. What you got? All right. So I, I got a couple. Hey, so, man. all right. So one, one of them's music tech related. One is, uh, you know, documentary related. I know sometimes I talk about different documentaries. I tend to always watch documentaries that a little bit uh, on the dramatic side, but there's this one on Barney. I don't know if you were if you guys remember Barney, <laughs> you know, the dinosaur. Uh, yeah, the purple dinosaur. <laughs> All right. All right. I was speaking of bad we imp- going there, <laughs> speaking of bad impersonations. <laughs> so so it's about Barney. It's called I love you. You hate me. And okay. it's really good. Like uh, my girlfriend and I started watching it this morning and we were just like, didn't even want to stop it. Like, oh, my God, like we had to just like cut it off because we got to, you know, got to got to do business and uh it's, but it's really good yeah it's it's about basically like you know with the intentions uh that uh, the lady who uh, i forget her name Cher- cheryl or sharon leach something like that she you know created this because she had a very hyperactive child mm. and she was you know looking for different types of stuff to you know play to keep him sort of locked in and paying attention and stuff so she created this character 
did it all herself, super DIY, and then eventually it just kind of like snowballed and just blew up. But then a lot, there was a, I don't know if uh, Mike or you guys remember seeing any like Barney backlash where there was like a fan, like not a fan, well, I guess a fan club. It's a, a whole secret society of like people who like hate Barney. Because <laughs> there was, because there's one guy on there, the guy who started it, you know, he would leave to work, come, you know, for, I think he would leave for a little while, come home. And he's like, oh, you know, I thought my daughter would be excited to see me. And said she didn't care. She's so focused on Barney. He's just like, I hate this thing. Like, wow. my kid doesn't even get excited when I come home anymore. So he starts his fan club. And it's it's just really good. Like, it's I like would, an anti-fan uh, club, like a hate club. Basically, yeah, Barney hate club. I think that's actually what they call it, too. <laughs> but, yeah, it's like the the, the secrets is the the barney hate club secret society or something like that but yeah it's really uh interesting it's yeah whatever you thought you knew about barney and it's got the it's got bill nye on there it's got the dude from blues clues because they were all kind of you know like similar like kids shows and stuff and yeah it's it's just really really interesting and pretty Dude, entertaining that is a very interesting rabbit hole you found yourself when in. you say secret society like it's how not really secret. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> like, yeah, how, like, like, how do you like? Like, do they have weird rights or like rules? They're just like we're like, yeah, that's, that's like us. Like, all right, we're a secret society. That's true. Like, well, it's not, not just, much of a secret anymore. <laughs> but and also just the fact of the world we live in and the you know sort of the way that unintended consequences come out. You know, a couple hundred years watch as like historians look back at that society as somehow like leading to some future conspiracy that topples civilization. Yeah. It's, you know, it's always gonna be something like Barney that that spins out of control. Right? Yeah, it's something that it, you know completely had innocent intentions. Like to me, I think uh, was it the um, what is it those little like alien teddy bear things? Teletubbies. Teletubbies. Like to me, that's way more cult cultish because people were thinking that you know is there something that some kind of weird signals that they're putting in through the you know while kids are watching this to brainwash them. Like people actually <laughs> thought that that like why are kids so addicted to this? And it's like to me. Teletubbies probably had that going on because that is some of that is very culty. I think the the behind the story for Teletubbies. I remember I can't remember any of the real details, but I know it was way weirder than I expected. Yeah, I believe it. Like, but yeah, I, I if any of you guys have Peacock, I would I would recommend watching. It's really. I don't really think it was like evil per se. Just weird. Mm -hmm. Just really yeah. weird. Yeah. Like people are weird and weird people do weird things like make TV shows. And I think that's really what what it's about. It's that like, you know, but it, it you know, it resonated because it was, you know, I don't know, simplistic, simple. Yeah, I think, it, yeah, something about about the innocence of it. Maybe just people are like, this can't be. You know, because like when you think of like Sesame Street, like they talk about this too, like uh, like the like Bernie or Bert, like they you know they seem a little broken, like you know Big Bird, like Oscar the Grouch, like they seem a little broken, like dude lives in a trash can, that's not very you know, but Barney is just like like all day, <laughs> just ha yeah. happier than ever, like dude wins the lotto every day or something, but yeah. But that's, they're that's like, the no, drugs. he can't. Be, no, he, yeah, people actually thought that. Like, they said that. Like, people thought he kept drugs in his tail or something. Or oh my god, because dude, dude, you just gotta watch it. I don't want to talk about it anymore. I, I want you guys to watch it. But yeah, it's really like good. <laughs> people get weird about that. Like, why? Okay, I can understand if like the guy who played Barney, if people were accusing him of of doing whatever. But like, why would he go out of the through the trouble of putting like storing things in the tail of this? People don't really think through their conspiracies, like. Oh. No, fundamentally, humans are pretty lazy, right. yeah. and 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 they don't. I, I don't know. I'm just. Would they like? People, I think, give too much credit to like just how elaborate some of these conspiracies would need to be to like work. Yeah, uh, maybe I'm naive, wild. but if I were Barney and I had a drug problem, I wouldn't stuff. I wouldn't store my stash in my tail. That's. I'm, but most people probably wouldn't think you would. It's like that's the last place people are gonna look. No one's gonna look at my tail for drugs. <laughs> I guess <laughs> no one's gonna look in your tail. It's too sweaty. Yeah, that's yeah. He's like, that's what they want. Nobody wants to know what's going on in the tail of that thing. Everybody, anybody who's ever worked anywhere near like theme park character suit, mm -hmm. like you don't want any, any you know, the, just a bucket of old sweat. Yep. Oh, that's, gross. that's no gross. good for anyone. But uh, I don't know. on a side note, getting back into some music stuff, uh, um, I'd recommend checking out the uh, the Berlin Studio uh, Reverb plugin. 
it just came out pretty recently and uh, got my hands on it. It's really cool. I was experimenting using our uh, Hyperion strings on it because especially since it, it's recorded, you know, in a much drier environment, it's uh, I wanted to really use like a super, you know, like a really dry source to hear how it sounds because you can choose on this little graph. It shows like where the violins are, where the cellos. So if you're using violins, then you would click violins. And then it has these sort of like simulated mic microphone positions. And it sounds really nice. Like it, it kind of like really like puts it into sort of that kind of has a, that Haas effect that I like that I've talked about using like cinematic rooms. And uh, yeah, it's really, really cool reverb. Definitely uh, would recommend checking it out. Sick. Nice. Uh, and then I wanted to hype the soup can mic, which is, I think that's just literally the name of the company. In uh, it's a UK company. Okay. Um, they're they're really inexpensive mics uh, for how fun and good they sound and how uh, like solid the build quality is. Mm -hmm. They even have a little mic mount for it that just is perfect. Um, I mean, it looks like a, a piece of plumbing uh, construction equipment or uh, a part, like just a clamp. But the way they've got it, it's just dialed in. I I definitely recommend uh, soup can mics. How did you um, find I this? Think it's yeah, just... it's soup, soupcanmic.co.uk. Exactly, yeah. And uh, they, they have different, they're different models are just literally different kinds of cans, <laughs> uh, which I think absolutely would shape the sound in different ways, honestly. Like it would just, the default one is the one you would get if you want to use the, um, the little mount for it, the stand mount. But I mean, you could rig it, a lot of different things to kind of grip these things. They're, they're, they're very extremely light. Um, I can't even remember where I found it uh, listed. And I just, it was really, it was like, you know, about 20 bucks. Oh, really? So it was like, oh, wow. yeah, they're cheap enough that you're like, huh, we'll see how that sounds. <laughs> and uh, like it comes in a neat little pouch. Um, def just really good production, like presentation. And, and the mic itself uh, sounds really good. Like nice. good enough. Uh, we would absolutely, you know, we used it in, a sa in sampling and we're going to use it some more. That's cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm always interested in new kinds of mics that have different characteristics that bring out musicality in different ways. So that's been a good keeper. I don't think it's a coincidence that your name is Mike. because <laughs> And you love mics. You love mics and you know your stuff about mics. It, I don't know all... if I know my stuff. It's more like I just try a lot of different stuff. and Because like at a certain point, you reach a pinnacle of specificate, like technical specifications. Uh, TL 103, I think, is probably... Maybe it's a controversial point of view, but I think it's almost the epitome of, a, of the ideal studio mic in mm -hmm. its frequency response characteristics and low noise. But like, okay, well, but what else is there? Like, mm -hmm. that's not all that you're, we're after, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I hate noise, but some kinds of noise can be fun, you yeah. know, in the right context. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, you know, surprisingly, a lot of these mics won't be that noisy because they're old dynamics, so it's the quality of the signal path that's going to, you know, that's going to determine a lot of it. And with proper recording equipment, these mics will sound really nice, clean, yet, you know, whatever it is that they, they their characteristics are. Mm -hmm. uh, the imperfect transducers that they each kind of have in them and their electronics will impart their, their personality on it without... Um, also, like degrading the overall usability of the signal, uh, but we'll see. I mean, that's going to be the next sort of experimental step. Is all right. Well, let's try this on some stuff. Yeah, no, that's that's really cool. It's like this like wild microphone contraption that it's cool. It's like just rigged up, ready to go. Just put it in front yeah. of something, and yeah, yeah. And then I'm, I think what I what I would I'll also try to do is knock the 103 out of that. And then just put that 103 in their normal 103 stereo setup with, like, so basically have 12 channels running on some kind of little, you know, the next studio instrument we do, or that I sample in, in my booth. Um, I'll do both. Uh, I normally abhor mono for acoustic instruments. Vocals, it's different. You know, it's kind of, you, you, you usually want to stereo. You do, stereo vocals, actually, unless it's in a hall, doesn't really usually work very well. Uh, Maybe because the way our voice projects is very directional mm -hmm. uh, in the way that the listener experiences it. So you don't normally expect like a wide sound from a person, <laughs> you know, unless you're in a big space. Yeah. 
But, uh, but that each of these would sound cool potentially on, say, an instrument like a guitar or ukulele, where it's going to just suddenly take on a very old recording sound. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's okay that it's mono in that kind of context. Yeah. And yeah, you know, that, and therefore it's a lot of channels, it's a lot of data, but we'll kind of, you know, it's like we'd pick and choose, all right, which channels actually sound cool? Like for this instrument, mm -hmm. maybe include them. We'll, we'll play around with that idea. Uh, don't want to overburden the, the libraries to make them like unnecessarily large, but if there's a really, uh, you know, worthwhile quality to capture uh, a side of the instrument to show that the, the, some of these other kinds of mics uh, and vintages of mics can capture, then, you know, it, it's worth it. 100%. Awesome. So send us your best character mics, S send us your best jokes, and go get Rain Song and write up a cue. That's the mission. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what you could do if you want to combine them all? Well, combine two of them. If you've got a, a, a really just crappy old mic uh, or muddy, something something that has a lot of character to it, do some vocals. Um, like a rainy track with some goopy lo-fi vocals, mm -hmm. just even humming a tune. That can add a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. Like, maybe just drop some vocals in it. You know, you don't have to be the best singer in the world. Just let the mic do a lot of the work. I'd love to. It'd be cool to hear more vocals. All right. We will call it here. Um, go get Rain Song. Like and subscribe. All that stuff. Craig and Mike, catch you soon, fellas. Later, y'all. Hoo-hoo! <laughs> <laughs> Later.